Good evening, sir. My name is Adesua Giwao Sage. My name is uh, Mohamed Bello Adwekan, Senior Advocate of Nigeria. Yes. I'm Attorney General. One time Attorney General I'm of. A Minister of Justice mm, of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Yes, from 2010 to 2015. April 6, precisely 2010 to May 29, 2015. The President, President Goluk, uh, Jonathan, you. Say in your book, um, the burden of the burden of service. The burden of service. Yes. You say you guys had a very close relationship. Yes, he was an excellent character, a great guy, and a fantastic leader. Mm. I think, I mean, it was the best Democrats I've ever come across. Not because it's my post, because he's a Democrat by practice. Mm. He was a consensus builder. Mm. And he made the man that listened to advice. And if you tell him anything, he say you can't even do it, no matter his bias or preferences. Okay. He was a great guy. And oh, he is a great guy. He is a great guy. He is a great guy. Um, and is that closeness that you shared, is that why you were considered a very powerful Attorney General? I wouldn't say I was a powerful Attorney General. I would say I was an effective Attorney General. Mm. I think it is out of way, out of order to call yourself or label yourself as powerful. I oh, mean, other forget, people would No, no, it's not true. I was mm. not as powerful as people wanted to ascribe to me. Mm. I mean, I would rather say I was an influential minister in the sense that I have the ability to push my cause, in the sense that I have the ability, I have the confidence of my principal, yeah. who believed in my judgment and who gave me the free hand to do my work and who supported me. He gave me all the support to do it, job. And for that, I remain extremely very grateful to him. You guys still remain close? He's, he's my boss forever. Mm -hmm. I have the highest respect for him. He's been an excellent, he's been a great guy. And he was very supportive when I was a minister. I cherish that memory. That's really good. So I am going to take you a little bit back, further back to like your childhood. <laughs> it's good, just like any other normal childhood. I was the boy next door. You were the boy next door. I, I think it's a little bit uh, different. I, I, I had a very, very humble beginning. Mm. My, I'm the first son, like you've read in my book. I yeah. had three siblings who died before I was born. Yeah. And so I was very well pampered by my mother. I mean, I was named Onipe, which is somebody like an inter, just like MK was named Kashimawo. Mm. You know, I was named Onipe because when I was born, I survived. And so I had a very special place in the heart of my mother. I was very close to my mother. And people always say, I'm particularly very close to my mother and my late grandmother, but to my grandmother who also mm. worked me up. But there was nothing unusual about my childhood. There was nothing spectacular. I went to primary school, I went to secondary school. I was an average student, just tried to work as hard as I mean, as possible. I mean, I had my target, I had my goals. I wanted to be a lawyer. Yeah. Hopefully and thankfully I became, I mean, thankfully I became a lawyer. And then when I became a lawyer, after some time, after the initial years of uh, ups and downs, I had a focus, I wanted to be a I mean, I wanted to be a senior advocate of Nigeria, to the glory of God, I became a senior advocate of Nigeria. When I was 20 years at the bar, I wanted to become the attorney general of the country, and to the glory of God, I became the attorney general of the country, and so I started on course, I'm very fulfilled. Mm. So any other thing that comes along the way is a bonus. Fair. You know, you described it like it was so. It was a really smooth sailing from law school to SAN to Attorney General oh, of the it, Federation. It, it, it could never have been smooth sailing. Yeah. There would be challenges mm. here and there. You face the challenges. You face the disappointment. But believing in God, believing in destiny. Yeah. I mean, one thing I never lost track of was my belief in God. Whatever you get in life is your luck. Mm. So I pray for luck. And my mother always tell me pray for luck. And I always pray for luck because luck is 80% of everything you become like. You may be the most brilliant lawyer. If you're not lucky for anybody to patronize you, yeah. you will not have the opportunity to showcase you're your brilliant. competence, yeah. your abilities, and whatever that will there take you to the top. So I believe in luck and I have been very lucky in life. Yeah, and I'm very grateful to that. Each time I've been under the threat of uh, financial difficulties. Mm. Somehow, somewhere, God has always come to my rescue. Mm. I mean, through some very good friends. 
And so I remain very grateful to God. I've been lucky. You've been lucky. I've been lucky. I wanted to ask you actually, because I remember reading in your book, because I wanted to ask you about your time in law school. Your time in law school was a bit difficult. But my time in law school was one of the worst times of my well, life. Well, my time in law school was a bit <laughs> difficult, but it, was also, it also inspired me to work very hard, to want mm. to get through, not to wonder, not to get a receipt, mm. not to do anything, because I knew, look, I was, I was on a budget. And I know how difficult it was for my parents to raise money for me, even in the law school. Mm. All right, but it was quite interesting because you met a lot of interesting characters. You met a lot of good people. You yeah. met a lot of bad guys. You met a lot. You met you met a mix of people. So when you're in law school in the seventies, right? No, no, in the seventies, in the eighties. Sorry, in the eighties. Yeah, you were born in sixty-three. Yeah, the other one. Sorry. Something not so much about me. <laughs> um, you're in law school. Was there no uh, dormitories at that point? No, no, no. The, the dormi- there was no dormitory for the male student at that time. There okay. There was only one dormitory which was at the bush area and it was meant for the female, for the female students. For the female okay. Students. It was after we left that there were dormitories mm. or mm. cells. I mean, for all the students. Yeah. And uh, so the people that came after us were quite lucky. I mean, I came after you. I don't know if I describe my <laughs> no, you are, my law school experience as quite a lucky. Generation. Um, I think no. the problems that we have, because as attorney general, you you law school falls under your purview in some ways. In, not, in some way, yes. You sit on the, the. I don't sit on the Council of Legal uh, Education. But okay. I, I constitute and recommend to the president. Mm. I mean, under the laws establishing the Council of Legal Education. Mm. The governing council of, or, or, of the, the law school. The law school. Yeah. And I also have an input substantially in the appointment of whoever become the director general of the law school mm. if there is a vacancy. Mm. And that's and so about I, yeah, and then I'm also a member of the body of venture. Yeah. So I was a member of the body of venture as the attorney general at that time. Yeah, I think it's very unfair when your generation refers to us as a pamper generation when we complain about legitimate issues that we have well, with the like current that, state of it, education. You your, your med, the methodology that you mm. were taught, under which you were taught, and mm. the atmosphere, the circumstances, mm. it were more conducive. And for I, learning. I, yeah, for learning. It were more, yours were more conducive. We went through education the hard way, but then I admire your generation, very pampered. I wish I would know your generation. I, I have to respectfully disagree. <laughs> I have to respectfully disagree. I think, you know, the reason actually... I'm not saying you don't work hard. No, it's not actually about, about my work hard. But, but I'm saying that the atmosphere... So like, is it very pampered? Very conducive atmosphere. Okay, let's use it. Let me withdraw the word pampered. No. Let me say you have I a conducive... I want to actually let me conducive for learning. Let me say it was very conducive let's for Let's talk learning. about a conducive yeah. environment Okay, look at it. Look at what happened during the time of uh, COVID. But when I disagree, what mm. I mean is that yeah. um, I actually want to bring it home to a point you raised in your book, which I have this argument all the time with people who will be willing to argue with me on this topic, That's which so is, <laughs> which is not the, no, but it is the importance yeah. of strong institutions, yeah. right? My problem with the Nigerian law school is, as you say, the conducive environment for learning, right? Is that when your institutions are not so strong, um, you have bad eggs that become empowered by the lacunas, <laughs> as you say. I have no doubt about that. And so then you then have a system which, you know, on my way here, I was actually just on the internet and I was looking and another lawyer who qualified before myself was talking about how every year he tries to talk to someone and his father was an attorney general of the state. <laughs> and he's like, every year I try to talk to someone about the state of the Nigerian law school because it will continue to... Deteriorate. Yes. It is, com- it is falling apart. No, I can, I can agree with you because when I saw the Bielsa campus of the Nigerian law school, mm. it, was a, it was appalling. It was an ISO. Mm. And I felt that that's not conducive for them. Mm. And I'm happy that the immediate past governor of River State um, his excellency to have some weekend with a good friend of mine, a brother. Yeah. I mean, I was taking very progressive steps to help in reviving the infrastructure at DK of the law school in Bielsa. I mean, I've also built a more term modern law school faculty, I mean, uh, campus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He also built courthouses. Yeah, you know, with, uh, with all the necessary facilities, mm-hmm. I mean, to make it very conducive for learning. And I think if more public spirited people like him, would come up 
to assist and to contribute and yeah. their own code, contribute their own code to the development of our health care and ultimately to the process of men. And I think that would be better for us. So I believe that a lot of people along the line will emulate. Yes. He, if I do have the opportunity to have them, I will. You emulate, I will you emulate um, former Governor Nia Somwike. You're yeah, very good friend. Yeah, in, in terms of his infrastructural development and okay. contribution to bigger development in the country, in terms of his uh, making it conducive mm. for learning. Yeah. And also many yes. members of the bar who are much, much richer than him that are not making such contribution. I think his effort should be commended. Mm. Yes. I think, um, yeah. Maybe I'm biased. No, I, I mean, he is your very good friend. He's but nice. I, don't I, will, I don't intend to deny him. <laughs> you know, no, I, I would not want you to do any such thing. Mm. Actually, you know, I was going to ask you about friends in politics because in your book, you name a lot of names and you so, talk so, so you talk about you know for example in your journey to become the attorney general um you have mentors who are helping you you have to go back to your to kogi state right and to see the governor of your state um because of federal character you have um two people from your state you and mr yemi awoni Right? Yomi Awoni. Yomi Awoni. Yes. And no, actually, Yomi Awoni was to be made the girl. Let me say this in deference to him. He's a very gentle man, a fine mm. friend, and a mm. senior brother. Yemi was actually the one slated for the ministerial slot in Kope. He's been promised because the president had assumed, rightly or wrongly, that I was from uh, Benue State mm. because of the president that was push pushing my candidature to become attorney general. So assuming that I was from Benue State, they thought there was a slot for you. I mean, Yomi in uh, Koji State. Mm -hmm. So when it became obvious that I was from Koji State, a choice had to be made. Unfortunately for me, and unfortunately for you, my brother Yomi, I mean, I was uh, selected over and above him. But he took it very, very, very calmly. Mm. And he was one of, among the first to felicitate and congratulate me. Really? And I commend and do my heart for his sense of... Uh, and the honest. <laughs> and he end, ended up being the deputy governor. He ended up being the deputy governor. Of, yeah, maybe that was his yeah. destiny. We have mm. different destiny. Everyone has their own path. And I was praying that he was going to end up as the governor of Kogi State. Mm. And it's never too late. We never know what God will do for him in the near future. That is true. Yeah. But, um, you know, I wanted to ask you about that because you have a quote in your book that says, Loyalty to the nation is more important than loyalty to friends. Did I? Am yeah, I missing? Very, very right. Mm. Uh, I'll be loyal to the nation. I will ask this question in the National Assembly. Yeah. That in the event of a conflict between the president and the constitution, what would my allegiance lie? And I said, I won't have my allegiance lie with the constitution because of the crown law. And that's the supreme will of the people. Okay. And that I will definitely side with the people. Yeah. I will tell the bringing of Mr. President, you are you know, on your own limits and you cannot exceed your limits. And I don't think that's anything to debate about. Mm. I don't think it's a question for anybody to even agitate over. That's fair. But I wanted to ask because, you know, right now we've been waiting for a ministerial list. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of politics involved that I think the average person is not aware of. Like, for example, in your book, you said um, because at that time, Dr. Bukola Saraki was very popular, you know, amongst the governors. I think he was head of the Governor's Forum at that yeah, point in time. He was chairman of the yeah. Governor's Forum he at that time. The Minister of Justice and there. he didn't want you, yes. Because possibly for a reason that he was not comfortable with me. They didn't know me. Mm -hmm. And they felt that I might not serve his political interest. Mm. And there's nothing wrong with that. Today we it will surprise you or you will amaze you to know that my father a very good friend. Yeah. I respect him. Yeah. He's one of the emerging leaders of this country. He we have served as the Senate President of this country, he has served as a governor. And he stands out well, irrespective of his political persecution. He remains one of the few political leaders in this country that have demonstrated in office capacity, competence, and I mean, in terms of uh, leadership. And I pray that in years to come, I'm going to extend my life. So you believe that um, the corruption allegations against him are is political persecution? I've been, vic I've been a victim of corruption allegations. Yes. By the immediate past government. Mm -hmm. The most incompetent government we've ever seen in this country. Run by the most incompetent president that this country has ever had and we will never have again. And run by, pro I mean, a set of political morons. So, if those are the people accusing us of corruption, then you better ask the question, how? I mean, it's a margin today that the corruption allegations against this past government is a margin. Let's wait for a while and we'll see what will happen. Let's let's see what will come out of the MFLA's uh, 
investigation. Let's see mm. what come out of the order that was still being investigated. Let's see what will come out about the N Nigeria saga. Let's see what will come out about so many Paris Club saga and so many other sagas that have been there. And then we'll be able to know who are those that are really corrupt and who are those that try to run this country aground. And who are those that may sacrifice to save this country mm. in terms of service. So, you know, I saw you quoted as being saying that time will vindicate you. Yes, and, you and it's, it's, it's vindicating me. The OPL... Um, you know, talk about the OPL 245, I'm sure you know that there have been so many judgments, so many trials in several jurisdictions. In I, Italy, in the yeah, UK, really, in the and US. I, and, and, I, I mean, and I've come down on scattered. I can oblige you the copies of the judgment, and I'm sure you would have read where at my efforts and my industry were commended, contrary to what they were... Mm -hmm. the, the scavengers and the rogues in this country when they to prove to the contrary. So who are these scavengers and rogues? They know themselves. The, you don't want to name them anymore? I'm naming, look, if I name them now, I've betrayed my book, which is coming out on OPL 245 in December. Oh, you have a book just on OPL 245? Because Nigerians deserve to know the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth about OPL 245. Okay. And the scavengers, the idiots, and those who really ruined this country and who sought to ruin this country and tried to make a scapegoat of innocent Nigerians. And I'm not going to go down without a fight. Do I look like an idiot? Do I look like someone who is a coward? No, sir. No, certainly not. I'm not going to go down without a fight. And I'm not going to go down without documenting history. Okay. So to give context to our listeners on what yes. OPL 245 is, it was a, it's an oil block. Yes. And it was given to, it was given by former dictator, Sani Abacha, or military leader, sorry. So I don't would you be patient enough, or would my, read, my listeners be patient enough to read my book in December? Because they will. You want me and to also sell, give them a brief... You want, you want me to, to sell? No. You want, you want me to give them... You have free. to also know, you have to... You They want to read the book. So before they read the book, they have to have a little idea of what, the, you know, what it's about. So OPL 245 was a block that was given to... Um, company, allegedly, uh, I mean, a company known as uh, Malibu Oil and Gas Company. Malibu Oil and Gas Company, which was allegedly owned by Dan Etete, who is uh, allegedly owned by Dan, among others. Among others. Among other competing claimants. And the most prominent competing claimant being the Abacha family. Yes, and, one, and a one-time vice president of this country, masquerading and hiding under the cloak of others. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't want you to push me, I told you. <laughs> Mohamed Abacha and... Um, and Mohamed Abacha has wound up in court that he didn't pay for the shares on my PL245. And I wonder, you're a lawyer. Mm -hmm. What gives you an interest in a company? Paying for the shares. Good. Or yeah. being gifted the shares. Being gifted. And he, 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 he neither said he got in for consideration of uh, cash. Mm. So let's wait and see. I mean, the matter is subjective. That's why I'm very reluctant to talk to about talk it. To talk about it because it's because still on the, 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 the matter. The matter is in court. Yes. But like I said, I can talk about it within the context of the various judgments that come out of Italy, London, mm -hmm. and uh, America. The, I'm sure you're aware that the U.S. Department of Justice, mm -hmm. the Security and Exchange Commission of the United States, as well as that of um, England and other places, came out with a very found you and, uh, and they've not found anything inappropriate about it. Mm -hmm. And so. When people talk, I just laugh at them, you know? But by the time the whole saga is over, and by the time you read my book on OPR to proper, I hope they won't stone some Nigerian leaders in this country, including those of them who profess and abuse and call people corrupt, but they represent the very symbol of corruption in this country. Mm. I need Don't to push me to name names. I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> I, I have to push you on this, because there is something you allude to in your book something very curious i need to ask yeah. because very often you name that's names yeah, mm -hmm. I that's and to tell you that i was not, that it was a i was prepared yes to so, turn issues mm -hmm. with anybody because i was truthful about it i'm one of the most documented i don't get around in this country i pride myself and i think you're um, the first to write i'm book the first to write time. a book and I, mm -hmm. I don't write on frivolities i write on serious issues of yes. state and you will make such an infounding allegation and damage me globally and expect me to keep quiet mm -hmm. and that's why there's follow-up book but I tell you, I'm very well documented, and there is nobody that has joined issues with me among all the people that I've met. Yes. And I'm ever ready for them to join issues, and I'll say no. Mm -hmm. I've been very restrained. Yeah. And I do hope nobody will push me. Okay. Good. I would say, like, there are four people in your book who are, like, common threats. Sometimes you name... Who are recurring. Yeah, recurring characters. Mm -hmm. I would say one is former Vice President Yemi Oshibajo. It's a shame. I don't want to talk about it. 
Yeah. The second one is former EFCC chairman. Um, he, has, he has apologized to me on for giving him. Mm. Uh, Bernard Bridges and I sympathize with him over his ordeal. Well, I'm happy that he went through, he tested. I mean, um, he dissolved in his own stew to the extent that he tested a dose of his own mercy. Mm. I'm happy that he realized that he wronged me and he had the courage to say he's sorry and that can be sufficient. Mm. And I wish him well. And I've genuinely and honestly forgiven him. Mm. And I'm one of those who promote his issues mm. because I felt he was misguided, he was used. He didn't have the emotional intelligence to what they made up you know, applying himself to behaves. But I haven't said that much, that he had the courage to apologize to me and regretted his action to me was not sufficient. Um, another, yes. another person mm -hmm. who comes up, I mean, which we discussed, we mentioned is Mohammed Abaja. I'm, I've forgiven him. You've forgiven him? I've forgiven him. His father was nice to him. That's what a lot of people don't know. If I, was a, if I were in a position to have helped Mohammed Abaja in the context where I write, I would have helped him. If I were in a position to help him, if the situation were right, I would have helped him. But because under that circumstance, yes. the circumstance was not right for me. And like I said, my allegiance is to the law, to fairness, to justice, and to equity, and not to individuals. Mm. So that's why. But I see him as a younger brother. I see him as a friend. We talk, we meet, we banter. And I, I don't I don't dare grudges. I'm moving for grudges. You see Mohammed Abata yes. as a friend? Yes, he's my friend. I don't buy Did I don't you support away. his uh, candidacy? Ask him. In 2015, I thought he was the best person to be made the governor, to be the candidate of the PDP for governor. For governor? Yes, for governor, notwithstanding all the antics at the time. Because I have this ability to be objective. Mm. And like I told you, even if he was nasty, his father was nice to me, and that should come for something. His father being Sani Abacha. Yeah, his father being Sani Abacha. He was nice to me, irrespective of whatever opinion anybody holds about him. Mm. Yeah. What and was your personal relationship with him? Interesting. I'd rather not discuss that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, there's someone else that you mentioned. Mm. I'm not sure if it's the same person. Mm. You talk about your run for Attorney General. There are quite a few people who are trying to pull you down in it's order to... Huh? Right. There are quite a few. But you name a human rights lawyer. You say a human rights he lawyer. Knows himself. He knows himself. You're not saying his name. It's diminutive. Everybody in this country loves him. Let him join the church with me. You don't wish to. But you know him. You named him later on in the book. I don't know if I did. <laughs> has he run for office? Never. Huh? Oh, yes. Of course, he has. Of course, he has contested. Governor Chef? I don't know. Governor Chef? <laughs> it left to your imagination. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but then I must set the record straight. Yeah. But don't forget that I'm a damaged brand globally. It's going to take me some time to get myself and my reputation mm -hmm. back. I've, there's been a reputation and damage. Mm. And, I have, and, I, and I have my action plans. So before this reputation of damage, and even before you were Attorney General, you were a very successful lawyer. Alhamdulillah. And you had a legal practice. And you... There's one particular case I actually want to ask about. Um, which is the Pfizer case. I have a non-disclosure agreement with my client. <laughs> Sorry, can I just quickly confirm? The Pfizer case was Professor Yemi Osibadro on the was counsel. I can't remember. You can't recall. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why are you so fixed that about Yemi Osibadro? No, no, no. I was just trying to remember from the Pfizer case if it was Pfizer or Halliburton. Well, he was the vice president of this country. He yes. Was, he's a very lucky man. Mm. Yeah, he's a very lucky man. Not a lot of people get to rise uh, to executive. Uh, and I wish him well. That's good. Um, so yeah, you said like EFCC was part and parcel of the briefs um, oh, yes, process. Yeah. This is what they were part and parcel of it. You know, there's a, I mean, the, you, brother, what the, the, the main contention was that they brought an American lawyer that they wanted to hand it over the yes. case to. And the American lawyers wanted that the three and a half percent of uh, whatever was recovered. And this is American, from the Abacha yeah, loot. Yeah, no, not from the Abacha loot. From the even the Pfizer case. I mean, the Halliburton case itself. The Halliburton case. And then case, the, okay. whatever decision they take, I as the attorney of the country don't have an input. I don't have a say, and that they have the final say. And mm. I said, I'm not a moron. I will not seek my power to you. I swore by the I swore by the Quran. I swore to hold the letters and the constitution. I'm not. 
Let me tell you, and I also know, and I've repeated it, and, yeah. uh, and time and time we'll prove that again. I am very conscious of when I went to office in circumstances under which I came to office. And I'm aware, and I stand by that dictate, mm -hmm. that the corrupt attorney general can bankrupt this country. And I don't want to bankrupt my country, so I did not participate in any act of corruption. And those of them who did, time and event will expect them, in a matter of time. I do think that time. And it's coming. All. It will come sooner than later. You know the beauty about tomorrow? Right. It's around the corner. <laughs> well, um, yes. Life, life is definitely very long, but I actually want to hone in on that American lawyer thing because I went to school in America. Mm -hmm. I was educated in America, and um, there's a certain. And I refuse to give those American lawyers, and I said yes. to the EFCC chapters, I won't but I don't them. understand. Do they come? To... They came. They came to solicit for the case. So the they EFC... come to solicit. For yeah, cases. they solicited for the case. Okay. Then the EFCC chairman brought them to my office. Then and it's thirty three percent. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, no, no, no. Whatever they recover, they will take thirty three. That's one third. That three, one third of the of the money recovered on behalf of Nigeria. Is that not an exorbitant? Well, they said that is the tradition in America, and I said no. I have Nigerian lawyers who are equally competent, very brilliant, very successful, who mm. will do it for much, much less, and they did it for much, much less. And in any case, they were proposing a civil action. And you were saying no, no, no. I took the criminal route. But then they got uh, General Tiwa, then you want to go and speak to the president that I should pay them. And I said, Mr. President, please stay out of this. Mm. So that they probably don't know that you love your country more than they think you do. Otherwise, they won't be coming to tell you to pay out money to some American lawyers. And that, again, did not go down well with some people because they're people that have their own arrangement. And I don't care. And in any case, that was no payment that was effected that was not with the presidential approval. I was not stupid. Whatever I did, I got presidential approval because I know that by virtue of Section 5, the president was the sovereign of the state mm. and that the president had the executive power and that the framers of the constitution were not stupid when they vested the power of the executive in the hand of the president as an individual and not as an institution compared to Section 5 and Section 6 of the constitution where the other arms of government were vested in the institutions, institutions as yes. opposed to an individual. And it also gave the president the power of delegation. So if the president delegates to me any cause of action, any assignment, mm. I'll carry it out within the framework of the rule of law. I will not exceed the law, and I will not exceed my apparent or ostensible authority. And nobody has been able to say, both in OPL 245, or both in the Halliburton case, or whatever cases they want to talk about, that I exceeded my authority, either ostensibly or fact, I mean, otherwise, mm. actual or ostensibly. Mm. So, why should I be bothered? Mm. I mean, the only thing I should be bothered is about the fact that I have children. And then, so the one of them even sat down somewhere and said, oh, I think he cheated me. Meanwhile, he has refused to come out and lay claim openly that he has an interest in OPL 245. Then you begin to ask yourself, you begin to ask yourself, how did Adoke cheat him? Who's the one of them? He knows himself as I speak. And when he sees this, he knows. It's unfortunate. And they are supposed to be frontline citizens of this country. Mm. But shamelessly and, uh, I mean, shamelessly lie without conscience. Mm call their colony of kids and followers and tell them tales about other people. Destroy other people's reputation because they think they can do so. And they think you cannot fight back. And I would say, no, I'd rather die fighting back than to die the death of a cow. So you said, uh, for example, actually, no, for example, you actually just said that um, T.O.I. Jam Juma Went to no, the lawyers, the lawyers went to him. The so American they lawyers to seek, to, his him support. to seek his support. I mean, they didn't tell, I, I assume they didn't tell him the truth about it. I mm. assume they didn't disclose the entire facts to him and so on and so forth. So he spoke to the president that the attorney general was not paying the foreign lawyers. In fact, I was a minister in the government too, who served as a minister in charge of Ambiada, foreign, well, I mean, minister of foreign affairs, mm. who went around running his mother. The foreign lawyers in Halibutin were not paid. Meanwhile, he didn't know the circumstances that there were no foreign lawyers. They made a proposal which I declined. But for a senior lawyer of his standing, he went around running his mouth, defaming people, simply because in one of his transactions, I told the president to revoke his transaction because he acted inappropriately and that is it was suggestive of corruption. So it was his own way of getting back. His name is in my forthcoming book, so don't worry. Don't so but you will name it now. No, not at the moment. You, but you give, you've given us an idea. It's left for you to make your choice. So, Tia Danjima and Sapetro, 
owns OPL 246, right? I don't, I don't know anything about 246. It's in your book. <laughs> you wrote it. you wrote is about it. it. Is it the owner? Huh? Is it the owner? You named it in your book. No, is it the owner? You said T.Y. Danjuma, Sapetro, OPL I'm, I'm 246. Going, you, know, you know I'm going old now. Those are fact, whatever I said about OPL 246, I mean, are factual issues mm. recorded. The yes, 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 yes. So yes. go to CAC, go to DPR, mm. I'll go to, I mean, they have a new name now under the PIA. Mm. You'll find out who are the owners. So it's not something that are not verifiable. And as they come out to deny it in case in, in the event that I named. Okay. In the likely event that I named, will you deny that? No. So I don't intend to be rude to me. He's the one I have a lot of respect for. Mm -hmm. He's uh, an elder. He's an elder statesman of this country. He fought for the to keep this country united. Mm -hmm. I mean, so he deserves our respect. He has served in various capacities and I have a lot of respect for. 